So I think that there can be a role for inflation. Whether or not it's true, I'm not sure. 10%, right? But nevertheless, it does serve a, an obvious purpose that we might like to take advantage of in understanding why we started from someplace very special and got the universe we see. Well, now that we've cleared all that up, <laughs> um, I doubt that there are any questions because it was all very clear. But on the off chance that there are any, um, anyone? Um, I think with the microphone, because we will bring a microphone to you. There's a, there's a lady here, please. And then there's someone at the back there. I'll, I'll dot around. I'll, I'll and please, uh, please make it a question and not a short lecture because we're pushed for time. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Um, is it on? Yeah, excellent. So um, if we could figure out what dark matter and dark energy is, would that give us any better of a picture of what happened at the beginning? No. Next. No, no, no. Roger. Well, let me just say, I mean, there are two <laughs> concepts to make sure they're completely different. The, one of them is called dark energy, which is meant to be explaining this exponential expansion that we see. The other is dark matter, which explains why the rotation of galaxies isn't constrained by just the matter we see. There is other matter. Now, the, the dark energy, I think they're both very bad names because, first of all, dark energy is neither energy in the ordinary sense of the word, nor is it dark <laughs> because it's, it, it's invisible. <laughs> So I think it's it's not. I mean, dust. You see, you see these dust rings in galaxies. That's, what, that's those are dark things. But dark energy is not dark. It's dark energy. It's a, I think it's simply the term that Einstein introduced in 1917 for admittedly completely the wrong reason, but <laughs> it was right. <laughs> that this term in his equations, the only thing you can do without wrecking them is this thing called the cosmological constant, and it seems to be there. It was taken seriously by cosmologists, even if not by Einstein, after he introduced the idea. So that's the dark energy. Of course, it means why has it got the value it has and all that sort of stuff. Dark matter is a different kettle of fish. Dark matter is something, it's a material which is out there and it is invisible. Now, I should explain that this crazy theory I was just talking about earlier, which I consider not so crazy, but that's most... Anyway, that there's an eon before, before ours. The thing which constrains the universe, if you look at the equations, and I'm not going to give them to you here, but if you look at the equations, you see there has to be something, a dark material as w or an invisible material, which dominates the material in the universe. It has to be there, or the equations don't make sense. And this is what I claim dark, dark matter, I think it's right way around, dark matter is. So it's got to be there for this theory to make sense. Dark energy, it, or the cosmological constant, certainly has to be there for the theory to make sense. So if you want reasons, the other way around, if you like, the theory doesn't work unless you have both of them. Now, the dark matter, exactly what is it? Well, in this theory, it's nothing that particle physicists would think of. The particles of dark matter would be about what's called the Planck mass. That is something like the mass of a flea's eyeball, I think is usually the way people <laughs> describe it now. It's, it's uh, 10 to the minus 5 grams, 1 over blah, blah, 1 with 5 zeros grams. And that is not so small, not so big. I mean, it's, it's big from particle, particle physics point of view because it's hugely more massive than a proton. <laughs> So particle physics don't consider it. But, th th but that's what the theory predicts. You've got something like that, perfectly consistent with observations, has to be there because the theory is, says it's got to be there. That's Qu the best answer I can give you, I'm afraid. Quick question. Why, if it's there, why haven't we seen it? It only interacts gravitationally. It? Seen. I yeah. mean, so it's here. We've mm -hmm. detected its influence. It's in the room. Yeah, oh prob yeah. probably. Oh yeah, well, yeah, you can't yeah, say yeah. that for absolutely sure, but probably it's in the room. Yeah. Yes, yes. That glass is full of it. But it only interests <laughs> gravitationally. Yes. You don't Excellent. see the air either. No, no, I'm willing to take it on faith that it's here. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the need for some, actually. <laughs> there, was a, there was a question back there. Um, yes, put your hand up again, whoever it was. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so I just was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about the motivation, the cosmological motivation for the multiverse and like where the other universes would be because <laughs> I, I know like in Everettianism they kind of occupy the same space and just don't interact. Okay, so uh, in terms of motivation, I, I, I think as a scientist, really our only motivation is try to understand uh, the, the universe and the world around us. So 
if there is one universe or, or if there is a multiverse, whatever we find, that's the one we find and, and we report. There is no other motivation except that one. And uh, we looked, and that's what we found. It's, uh, until now, um, physics has been concerned. In, in fact, physics wasn't even a field un until a century ago. Um, and, and physics has been concerned with small scales, intermediate scales, large scales. Once you, you have a good understanding of what's inside your universe at all possible scales, then of course you come head on with the big question, the biggest question of all, at least for, for our universe, which is what was there before our universe came, came into being? And, and um, uh, that kind of uh, theoretical motivation to try and understand always one step further has come in tandem with uh, progress in, in uh, observational physics. We can see further now. We, we can, uh, that, that's why I said before, we don't have a choice whether our universe had a beginning or not. We know it at the beginning, we can see it. Looking far away in space, we are looking back in time. So we, we can uh, practically um, run the, the cosmic story of our universe backward and see that, that it, it, it started small and, and it grew big. And, um, but where are they? These are the universes. Um, here is the main philosophical reason on why the uh, multiverse research really took off only on the last 10, 15 years or, or so. It's not that people didn't conceive of, of the possibility before. In fact, the first one was very curious, the, the atomists. But uh, um, the 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 general belief in the physics community was that <coughs> even if there is a multiverse, you can't apply the scientific method to it. You can't see it with direct observation by definition. Nothing can travel further than um, you can't send a light signal and, and uh, receive it um, beyond the edge of our universe. And the only way we can see is by sending and receiving light signals. So if I can't receive a signal beyond for, for structures or whatever there is beyond the, the horizon, of, of our local universe, it means that we cannot test what's beyond the horizon of our universe. So that seems to imply that uh, uh, these theories are not scientific. If you can't test them, then they are not scientific. And, and that's part of the work I, I did uh, about 12 years ago. Um, we showed that uh, that's not correct. You can test them. Um, not by direct observation. In, indeed, you can't receive a light signal, but, but you can use, uh, first off, a coherent theoretical mathematical structure that, that uh, makes predictions at all scales. So if, if they are found to be correct, then, then one, that's one hopeful direction. But there is another tool that you can use, and that is quantum entanglement. So if you think of our local universe and whatever else there is beyond our universe in, in the cosmos, um, in, in, in the work that I did in, in, in my theory, all, all of these structures were once uh, wave functions of the universe. So they, they were quantum entangled with one another. And uh, if, uh, if quantum mechanics is, is uh, if quantum theory is valid, then entanglement is always present and the information is never lost. Meaning that even though eventually all these branches decoupled from one another and created universes in a similar story to, to how our universe was created, uh, that, that information about their early entanglement, about their origins, is still there. It's imprinted in our sky. And, and that's where cosmology is, is one of the most exciting fields in physics because whatever we see around us today, in this big, boring, nearly empty universe, Whatever we see, it's actually a snapshot of the infant universe. That cosmic microwave background, it's, uh, the, the younger generation won't, won't know, but, but uh, uh, the older ones remember the, the TV sets. When, when you couldn't find the channel, the, the old TV sets, you'd get that buzz on, on the screen. That, that was the cosmic microwave background that you're observing. But that cosmic microwave background today at 2.7 Kelvin, is nothing more than just a rescaled version, a stretched version of the radiation that was created early on in, in the life of the universe. So it contains all that wealth of information. And, and so in, in short, in, at least in, in my work, and, and I think uh, there was a lot of work being done after that in, in other variations of the multiverse, <laughs> Once you have this coherent picture and you have a tool, quantum entanglement, that you can calculate how that signature changed 
the, the cosmic microwave background of your sky and what that should look like today, or at shifted today in our <coughs> present universe, then you can make a series of predictions. And, and that's where we got lucky. One of the things we predicted Sorry, have to uh, in Sorry. 2005 was, for example, there were seven, but uh, the, the most dramatic one was the existence of a giant void in the sky. And at the time, of course, everything thought we were crazy to, to talk of a 10 degree area in the sky being empty of structure, but only a few weeks ago that was uh, confirmed as a five sigma discovery by the Planck satellite experiment. So there is one example where you can have proof. Okay. Um, sadly, I'm afraid <coughs> we are fundamentally out of time. Um, and we can't run it backwards or get it from any other universe, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, so really all that remains is for me to ask you to join me in thanking our panellists. Um, I can also just tell you before you all head off that the next debate here is mind, matter and mechanism. Oh no, that's in the other one, isn't it? Because we've moved, yes, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all three will be going to the bookshop where you can um, pester them with more deep and philosophical questions that they don't want you to ask. Um, Roger's going to be uh, talking about um, beauty in our world and physics, truth and beauty at four. Uh, Lara's going to be in conversation over lunch at an open platform, and Sean's going to be back here, back in the ring at three. All right. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Did you know that the Institute of Arts and Ideas also has a podcast? Philosophy for Our Times brings you the biggest ideas from the leading thinkers around the world every week. Search for Philosophy for Our Times and subscribe today on your favourite podcast platform, SoundCloud or iTunes to make sure you never miss an episode.